Welcome to today's special news briefing on extreme heat, described as the number one climate killer. Last week alone saw four consecutive days that were the hottest ever recorded on Earth. This is the first of three statewide news briefings to track the onset of extreme heat in California and what key state and local agencies as well as community-based organizations are doing to help people loca and localities adapt. Today, we welcome speakers who will help us understand what is extreme heat and how the state is mobilizing extraordinary resources to protect its more vulnerable, most vulnerable residents. Now we're going to start with V. Kelly Turner, who is Associate Director of Urban Environmental Research at UCLA, and she will give us a wider context for understanding extreme heat. Professor Turner, please go ahead. Welcome. Hi, thank you so much for having me today um, to speak with you all about this topic. Um, I'm an associate director at the Luskin Center for Innovation, which is an environmental policy and planning research center at UCLA. And we work a lot on bringing sort of the science of extreme heat to um, effective policy and planning. And so the first thing that I usually tell people when we're talking about heat is that there's really three buckets. The first is extreme heat, which gets a lot of play. This is heat waves, uh, weather that's exceptional in some way. And that we know that that extreme heat's gonna get longer and worse in the future. Um, and then that's made even worse by the way we build cities regionally. We put a lot of buildings and impervious stuff out and that creates what's often called the urban heat island effect. The urban heat island effect, which makes whole cities hotter than places that are not developed sometimes. Um, but, on the other hand, this third bucket is the human heat burden, and that is the way that people experience heat as they live their daily lives. And I argue that this is the one that matters the most to the quality of life of Californians, and it's also the one that's most inequitable. This is basically neighborhood to neighborhood, um, what kind of infrastructure green and gray is available to people. So one of the most important things we can do to address extreme heat and inequity is to think um, more specifically about shade infrastructure. And that's because primarily the way that people feel hot is from exposure to the sun. And so you can reduce temperatures on the body by about 30 to 40 degrees Celsius um, as measured by a composite metric that we use in our lab um, in just a few feet. And that's just by erecting a shade structure. And so we define shade structure, straight, excuse me, we define shade infrastructure as all of the green and engineered sources of shade, including awnings, sails, and multi-story buildings, and the policies and planning tools needed to implement them effectively and equitably. Um, because most Californians are effectively living in shade deserts currently, um, but the distribution of shade in the city is very inequitable. So I wanna highlight um, the example of Pacoima where we recently did a shade audit in a neighborhood and a school. And we found that the school has, for instance, less than 10% shade in the midday hours. Um, and that's when kids are out having recess, recreating, eating lunch. And this is not atypical, this was a very typical uh, California school. So what do we do about it? Well, we need to be really specific about settings like schools or residential or transportation because different um, in interventions are going to be needed in each setting. So in schools, play yards need less asphalt and they need more shade to effectively address the heat issues that children are facing. Um, but we also need to address regulations. It can be really difficult, for instance, to just erect a shade structure in a school because the way construction is financed and regulated by the state. And if you're interested in this, um, we can you can take a look at, um, we have a series of heat policy briefs at our center. I believe the link will be sent out. Um, one on the housing sector and one on schools. Um, and one of the things that we argue in our school's brief, for instance, is that we need to center equity. The regulations and interventions are only as good as our ability to put equity front and center. And that's because even well-intended ideas can fall short if we do not. For instance, grant-based programs for school greening may be very difficult to access if a school doesn't have the resources or the personnel to go after them. 
Um, I'm very excited that um, the interest in shade is shared by the state. Uh, we were just awarded, along with our partners, KDI, um, a, a planning grant and a climate adaptation planning grant to create a shade equity master plan for the unincorporated areas of East Coachella Valley. And this is something that we hope that every community in the state of California will have is a shade audit and then help them to make a plan to introduce this because it is such an effective way to address the issue that matters to people, especially low income individuals who live and work a lot of times outdoors more so than folks that do not. Thank you so much, Professor Turner. Um, so you were you talked a lot about shade. Um, and you said that you also have some thoughts about housing. Can you ad advance some of those thoughts as well to us? Yes, yes, happy to. Um, so one of the things that is the mo biggest low hanging fruit for the state right now is that it's perfectly legal to rent a home that is too hot. Um, so while there are regulations that define what is a tenantable dwelling um, for, for cold weather, there's not for hot weather. And that's just not commensurate with the reality right now that California keeps getting hotter and hotter. Um, so, you know, this is one thing that can be done at the state level. It can also be done at the city level. But one thing that we found, um, we were out in East Coachella Valley and we compared Palm Springs, which has, um, a, a threshold. Um, they're one of those cities that has passed a threshold, a maximum temperature threshold for tenants. Um, and then we did some measurements in, uh, mobile dwellings and, um, in, in the city of Oasis or the community of Oasis. And what we found is that if those mobile homes had air conditioning, they sometimes got hotter than the Palm Springs standards still. But those that didn't were above the Palm Springs standards all day long and sometimes hotter than the air temperature outside. Um, so this is an interesting case because it highlights both that there need to be standards and they need to be equitable. I mean, this is just across the highway from each other, these two communities. Um, but it also highlights that there are housing um, forms that are you know, more precarious and that um, we can do um, certain things with housing, uh, augmenting building codes for housing that's new construction or retrofits. And then there's another set of regulations that need to be addressed for, for renters. And then there's yet another for um, mobile home dwellers and the unhoused. 40% um, of deaths during extreme heat events are the unhoused community. Um, and so really looking across the different housing types will be important um, as we move forward. We're going to go ahead and invite uh, Dr. Lucia Abascal. She will give an overview of how the state is mobilizing its resources to combat extreme heat. Please go ahead, Dr. Abascal. Welcome. Yes. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to you again. Last time we were talking about another public health emergency, uh, COVID-19, and now uh, we're talking about not a new one, but a very important one as well, which sadly we don't have a vaccine for, but we do have some measures. Uh, the issue is that not everybody can adhere to them in the same capacity as we were just hearing. So I just want, want to start by telling you um, just a story. I, I was, I mostly, I'm in Mexico right now because that's where I'm from, but I mostly live in San Francisco. And so I cannot complain about the heat there. Uh, but I was talking with a woman, a woman that works with me in a research project, and she lives in the Coachella Valley. And I was uh, asking her, can you, can you please tell me about your experience? She's from the Purepecha community, which are, uh, it's an indigenous community from Michoacan, Mexico. And they've been living in the Coachella Valley uh, for a long time. And they are mainly, uh, they work in agriculture. And, and she said, yes, that's a very, very big problem. Uh, um, first, because, uh, I mean, we have the immediate effects, right? A lot of the people that work in agriculture in the Coachella Valley live in really old trailers that are even from 1920. They don't have air conditioning and they don't have the capacity to install air conditioning. So they, when they, they she was telling me that they've reached even 125 and that the trailers get even hotter. So there's no safe place for them to go. And once they are outside, there's no shade. So that's a very big issue that's impacting their communities. And I mean, 
many communities like her. But she was also talking about the consequences that might not like cause like heat stroke. For example, she was telling me that the one of the big cooling sites they have in Coachella Valley, uh, Salto Sea, uh, was starting to to dry, and that was. Uh, causing that some uh, chemicals in the bottom were racing and now that her house smells like sulfur. So just a lot of consequences, even in these places that are used to heat and they've always experimented heat, what we're seeing, what we expect to see uh, going forward is even a couple of degrees that can make, make things way harder. We know that heat is a, a main killer of all the disasters, of all the natural disasters, heat is a main um, a killer. Just I was reading the other day in the New York Times that uh, just last year, 60,000 people died in Europe because of extreme heat, right? And we all start seeing those numbers uh, in the US, in California. And I, I, we at the, at the state really want everybody to be prepared. And I wish we could do something, and we can, I mean, but it will take longer to change the course of things. But right now, it's very, very important for everybody to understand the dangers of heat. And that's why one of the main things we are doing is these sort of activities to inform the public about the dangers of heat, right? So what are important things to consider when thinking about heat? We we like to focus uh, especially on, on three. So... First, uh, stay cold. Uh, I mean, sorry, stay cool. Uh, stay cool. Uh, if you if you can stay inside in places with that have AC, if you're uh, fortunate to have it in your house, try to turn it on. If not, local libraries, malls, and other places where you can get AC uh, are are good places to go. You can find in the in the website Pilar shared with us. There's a list where you can find cooling places by each county, and there you can direct people in your own counties to go to them. Then the next one is to stay hydrated. Very important to make sure everybody, especially high risk populations, small children, pregnant women, elderly people, and people uh, that might ha have a disability. It's very important that uh, to make sure everybody's hydrated. Even though they are at risk, we know that even somebody that's healthy can suffer from heat stroke, okay? So everybody, this goes to everybody, stay cool, stay hydrated. And lastly, check in in each other. If you have an elder relative that might live alone, if you know somebody that's working on the fields, if you know somebody that has small children, let's make sure that we take care of each other. So those are the three main things uh, that we want everybody to, 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 to know. And then uh, lastly, what is the state doing? So first we want to raise awareness and then there's different plans to increase cooling spaces. And I mean, that's in, in the short term, but also in the long term to also try to have more trees in cities, build more shades, as we were hearing uh, Professor Bikeli uh, tell us. And those initiatives, there's a very big investment uh, of millions and millions of dollars that the state is giving because extreme weather is one of the priorities from Cali the California Department of Public Health and from the governor's office. And yeah, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Abascal. Um, can you talk a little bit about what Cal OSHA is doing to protect workers, farm workers, and indoor workers? Yes, yes. Uh, that's an, an excellent question, and uh, thank you for bringing it up. It was... Uh... I had to mention it, but uh, we have to remember that workers have rights and within those rights are the rights to take a break and also to stay hydrated and take drinks. They are going to be regular um, OSHA um, uh, workers are going to be visiting some working sites to make sure that the uh, employers are adhering to the rights of, of employees. So that's an, a big effort we are doing. And also a uh, work, I mean, helping employers um, come up with plans 
and know the regulations and the rights of their employees. So especially by providing, if people work outside, just monitoring the weather, uh, providing shade, cooling spaces, hydration, make sure they're working uh, the right amount of hours, make sure that they are capacitated to know and their workers to know the signs and symptoms of heat stroke, which can include dizziness, leg cramps, uh, feeling kind of like out of yourself, um, and then what to do if that happens to, to, to any employee. So those are some of the things um, that OSHA is working with employees to, to, have, in, to have in place. Um, also, uh, the previous speaker alluded to inequities, and we do know those exist. Uh, can you talk a little bit about who are the most vulnerable populations to, for the heat yeah. situation? Yeah. Yeah, so I think we, we can talk of vulnerability uh, two ways. So we have people that are physically vulnerable to the heat, uh, even though everybody is. We have small children, elderly people, people uh, with disabilities. So those are the people that their body might have a bigger, uh, harder time regulating the body. Right, because when we are very hot, our body goes into overtime trying to cool it off, and then the the issue really starts when our internal organs start warming up. So that happens to everybody. But the healthier we are, um, and not either young children or, or elders, it's easier. Also, pregnant women have to work double, so that's so that also makes it harder for them. Uh, but then we also have people that because of their living conditions, because their social determinants of health, cannot uh, take all the precautions they have. So who are they? People that are work, work uh, in agriculture, people uh, stay, that work outside, farm workers, they have a higher risk of being exposed to the heat. Also people that don't have um, cooling in their, in their homes or don't have access, for example, to public parks that might be shaded. We know that there's a, a correlation between like the heat people are experiencing and how their urban or, or not urban, their environ, living environment it, it looks like, no? So those are people that are also, also people that have no access to, um, to healthcare, people that might live far away and might not reach a health uh, provider in time when they are suffering. So all of the things we know that put people at higher risk also affect during a heat strokes. And I'm going to welcome uh, now Sandra Young. Sandy, welcome. Thank you very much. And uh, yes, I speak with my two hats that I've worn for 30 years, my uh, primary care provider to an overwhelmingly farm worker indigenous population in Ventura County, and then also as a equally long-term advocate um, and supporter uh, for the um, uh, MECOP, as you call it, um, Mixteco Indígena Community Organizing Project, uh, which is an extremely important organization in advocating for uh, the uh, rights of farm workers and particularly indigenous farm worker uh, families. So um, I, I, just a few points that others have not mentioned yet. I would say that in Ventura County, which is uh, clearly uh, less um, uh, heat challenged than Coachella Valley, but we have always seen heat-related injuries, heat-related illness um, in, in primary care, in the headaches and fatigue and rashes and uh, dizziness uh, and uh, fever uh, that people come to see us with. It's important as providers that we are able to recognize those symptoms as often being tied to uh, heat exposure. Uh, and I think we don't do that good a job uh, at, at recognizing those connections many times. So even though Oxnard is uh, cooler than Coachella Valley, if you picture a strawberry field, which is completely open, uh, where uh, workers are covered head to toe in um, uh, clothing, bandanas, to protect from dust and toxic chemicals, uh, and uh, then on top of that, you you are in a situation where uh, in part of the year, people's wages are tied to the quantity 
uh, of fruit that they pick uh, so that you will literally see workers running uh, with their heavy baskets of fruit to the trucks so that they can hopefully make that little bit of extra money that allows their family to pay the rent and, and eat uh, given uh, the low uh, level of farm worker wages. Uh, similarly to the open strawberry fields, picture the uh, what they call the, the high tunnels, the, the tarps basically uh, under which uh, crops like raspberries and tomatoes are grown where um, this is a huge enclosed tent uh, which traps the heat which traps the, the chemicals. Um, someone from Mixeco Project was just telling me that in the mornings when it's hot, uh, you can see the uh, fumigants rising out of um, these tents shortly before people have to go to work in them. Uh, mm -hmm. So these are uh, 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 chronic uh, conditions that are only going to be getting worse. Another problem that I want to raise is that while there are standards, uh, important standards, at least in California, uh, regarding water and heat and breaks, that these are largely ignored in the fields. Um, the uh, Mixteco Project recently did a caravan tour, and out of 12 sites that they uh, looked at, only three had adequate um, water uh, available. Um, water is often far away from where people are picking, so that even to go and get water, uh, you're going to be raising your body temperature uh, even more. Um, in addition, uh, while I think it's very the education uh, component of educating people around excessive heat exposure is extremely important, that we need to remember that uh, there are uh, the majority of farm workers in California are undocumented. This means that they are very often um, uh, not in a position to complain, to insist on their rights, to insist on their breaks um, for fear of being uh, fired, for, for fear of losing that tenuous hold on, on um, uh, existence that they they currently have. So, um, you know, I, I work with Mixteco Project, with Radio Indígena, a uh, very important resource for the indigenous community. They are already um, partnering with um, Heat Ready California. There are already Instagram uh, posts uh, and translation in Mixteco language uh, to bring this message to people. But I would argue that it more than education is, is required because of the enforcement factor and that uh, to me, uh, a way forward is to in, uh, mandate that every field with more than eight workers have an elected worker representative who is empowered to um, monitor the um, health and safety standards in that field and to work with OSHA. Um, uh, OSHA is a very important agency, but their resources are very limited. And when growers know that OSHA is coming to town, uh, they have a quick cleanup uh, oftentimes. And so there needs to be an on the spot uh, um, immediacy to uh, the ability of farm workers to insist on uh, the proper standards for um, heat exposure. And um, so that's, that's the work that um, I'm still doing. I think our healthcare system has a long way to go to meet um, be advocates for uh, a farm worker community um, to insist that pregnant women who are at very increased risk of uh, fetal complications, uh, miscarriage, and 
uh, heat stroke uh, are um, assisted with state disability uh, and uh, understand that um, the um, our healthcare system needs to be an advocate for uh, for our communities and not simply a passive provider of medical care. So I'll leave it at that and um, let the discussion continue. Just the other day, I was on Facebook and a person I know posted something about it being a lie that the Arctic Circle is getting warmer. You know, with vaccines, we had this information. Are we having this as a problem here too? I mean, I, I can add a little bit. I've done some work on the misinformation aspect. And I mean, I started that work with COVID vaccines and now I've just moved into misinformation period because it's such a big thing, right? And the, the crazy thing with weather is that we are experiencing, experiencing weather right now. No, no, it's not like... Yeah, the Arctic, that's easier to dismiss, but you cannot be in the middle of a heat wave and dismiss the heat wave. So I think there's like this complete disconnect of how the weather is connected and how our actions here where we are affect so affect others. And I think that's uh, the, the thing that's very disconnected and why communications, uh, as Marta was saying, is so important and just try to find a way when how people can understand how uh, weather is connected and how what is happening in the Arctic affects what happens in California and the coral, coral reefs in Florida, right? How everything is connected. And at the end, uh, we are experiencing the uh, effects of all of this uh, warming. And and I mean, heat, heat stroke is one of the fastest uh, and like fastest consequences of extreme weather right because like it happens like that but we're also going to start i mean water you no know, if people cannot access water if we can't access food you no know, and it just goes like downhill from there so uh, of course that information is very very important well thank you everyone this was an amazing discussion really great um and we appreciate you for being here today uh, I hope our media take this message to their audiences. Thank you so much.